I missed you last week. I'm you were busy. I have been so busy. It's crazy. Good. It is good. No, lots of clients doing. One of my side gigs is uh, forensic sexology. So it doesn't happen often, but every now and then somebody who's having, whose client is having um, a BDSM issue, whether being accused of something or uh, anything, <laughs> you know, help them evaluate what happened in the case. Okay. Right now I'm helping give them an opinion on an accidental death during breath play. Oh, all righty then. Yeah. So that came in last week and ugh. yeah. Folks, it does happen. Oh Be yeah. Be careful with breath play. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and of course the insurance company doesn't want to pay because the person must have known it was dangerous. Uh, whoops. <laughs> so, there goes half of what we do. <laughs> yeah, damn near all of what we do. <laughs> At least right. somewhere or another. So, I'm helping them uh, help the widow. So the hang up, the, the insurance company is saying, if you engage in something dangerous and die too bad, too sad, so sorry. Right. Which, in my opinion, is deliberately, not that this is in my statement, but I did say it to the lawyers, is really kind of singling out BDSM as being more dangerous than rock climbing. Well, I was about to say, don't they all fall into the same category, kind of loosely? Rock climbing, skydiving. Um, it's flying a small swimming. plane, the lawyer is saying. You know, I mean, and it's true. You know, I had given him like, you know, you know, uh, climbing up a skyscraper, uh, you know, parkour, bungee jumping. Yeah. Any skiing. Other. If, and if we're going to driving go, a car, <laughs> construction work. If I mean, every, every day there are human beings taking some amount of risk, being a cop, being a fireman. You know, I mean, uh, do they deny insurance to all of them? Hell no. But they singled out this act. So I brought that to the lawyer's attention, that this is an insurance, big insurance company selecting to not, uh, to not do this based, not to reimburse based on them not liking the fact that people do this sexually. What are they trying to liken it to, suicide? They're not calling it suicide. They're saying that he understood that, uh, you know, there are a lot of sites that say don't do this particular thing. His thing was choking. And, uh, you know, they're just not acknowledging. I mean, everything about the circumstances was made it clear that he was having a good time with his fetish. Got it. Okay. Right. So, and it was all very simple and it really was a tragic accident. What happened? You know, that's not the first time in whatever, 40 years of being in the scene that I've known somebody who accidentally asphyxiated themselves by playing alone. Yeah. You know. And he probably just thought it was going to be a simple self-pleasure moment. Hangman's hard on, so to speak. 
and something went tragically wrong. And now they don't want to pay out his considerable life insurance. Yeah, you know, it really gets into, I mean, it really gets into how society, and I mean, I look through the medical examiner's records and everything, and even the way they, they don't have the understanding or language for people like us. True that. You know, True that. they really don't. They don't have the legal language for it or anything. So the couple wasn't married. So the cops like dismissed her. Ow. Even though they'd been living together for a year and a half. In the same place, you know. You know they, you know they they're clearly uh, outliers. You know in their interests, and they're not rich. He had a regular technical job, you know, and I don't mean computers. I mean yeah, I get it. fixing machines, and. Uh, she was managing some properties. So they had no, I think they had no expectation that she would even appeal it and hire lawyers. I wonder how many times they do this to people and families just say, you know, everybody is so, see what was really great about this particular person she saw nothing wrong with their fetish. But I think most families, and this is always something for us to consider, like if we have a lot of children coming after us and, you know, it's like, and they find your toys and your dad, <laughs> or, you know, but I think most people, and usually it's parents, who find their adolescent sons in bed, you know, dead. They want to cover it up. So they're not going to make a lot of noise about it. True, true that. They just go, God damn it, you know, and they swallow it. And this girl has got the balls to say, hey, we always did this for fun. You know, we were planning a future together. No. I would think, and this is definitely the outsider's opinion, the only way to prove this was an accident is to prove that it had been done successfully in previous times. How do you prove that? Uh, uh, you, you could, but that could get messy. Right. I mean, right now what they'll have is a sexologist saying that this is a fetish that usually starts in your teens. Your job. And we don't even know how many millions of people do it or hundreds of thousands of people do breath play in private. You know, there's a meme on the internet, choke me daddy, right? No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's like a big thing among younger generation players and even people who are not in our scene. Somehow choking has been unfortunately mainstreamed. Without no any kind of in, of instruction or warning and or nobody, you know, despite in spite of Jay Weisman's best efforts, <laughs> it is now kind of popular. So, but the reality is that uh, most of these people start doing it in their teens, and they survive by being super cautious. Yeah, And as you and I both know, in the days before mutual consent and all of that stuff, the scene itself was a rough place to be. Admittedly, though, that was part of its excitement. It was, but it also re re resulted in injuries. Yeah, we were... <laughs> when you learn by doing and doing it wrong exactly success doesn't teach you the oops right so like i don't remember when david stein first coined the term safe sane and consensual 
but the time by the time I was really active in the scene, which was like 85, 86, that was pretty much in place. It was understood that it was consensual, that nobody wanted to end up in the hospital. You know, and that was that was your chief imperative. Don't put anybody. <laughs> yeah, the whole dying thing, very messy. You know, learning where you can hit somebody and where you can't. You know, these are things that are all now basic expectations, but which in those days were still discussions at Eulenspiegel, you know? Because we didn't even have a whole lot of technique classes that I can remember until at least the mid 80s. Yep, or later. Because by that time, LSM had done a few. And yeah. we moved to California. Uh, Leather and Lace was doing a few, very specifically for women. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them was led by one of the most wonderful transgender women I had ever met. Definitely a sister for LSM. And was teaching any woman who wanted to learn um, self-defense classes. She ran them for leather and lace, but she also started teaching anatomy and play. Woman's name was Wendy Allen, and she was incredible. She said, these are the things that you need to understand about anatomy, how yep. it works, why it works. She talked about ligatures. She talked about nerve damage. Um, she talked about muscle mass in ways that it damn near took a biology degree to understand. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hi, hit here. Don't hit here. Hit here with caution. And, I mean, it, there were some pretty good and very extensive classes. But that was 84, 85 in there. Well Okay, so here we are in 19, almost 20, sorry, almost 2022. I keep calling this, you know, 1921, which it is. <laughs> but here we are, almost 2022, and I can tell you that I'm, I see community people in my practice, but I would say the majority of people that I see are people who have no real contact with much less roots in the community, but they're doing BDSM at home. And they're forging BDSM relationships with their primary partners. And they have zero education. <clears throat> they haven't read books about it. They haven't attended classes about it. They haven't attended events. And it's sad to me because they're missing the whole beauty by having shitty experiences. Playing. And they're having shitty experiences because they really don't understand the complexity of consent. They don't really understand how power dynamics work between people and where boundaries have to be set. They really don't understand neither the submissive nor the dominant that the sub has a right to boundaries and a right to say no. Lori, I want to play devil's advocate to that argument for a minute because I'm only because when Fifty Shades of Crazy came out three years ago now, give or take, um, a couple of my old high school girlfriends, girlfriend as in female friend versus, you know, um, much to my surprise had been following my Facebook page. Now, for the most part, my page is wide open. Right. And uh, there had been some, uh, some chatter right after Fifty Shades about to love to obey to serve. And w well, two of them said, you know, we had read the book. It's the hottest fantasy we had ever had. We have always fantasized about this. At least they were smart enough to say, based on what I'm reading on your page, how do I talk to my partner? 
Mm-hmm. But I went, went, ooh, almost blew that name. Uh, Joanne, making up a name, asked. She found someone to ask. I can't help but wonder about the devastation of a woman who is just, oh my God, someone has opened up a fantasy. Maybe I can talk my partner into playing this fantasy game with me. Mm-hmm. Is and so looking at that scenario, is there a way to put a a bookmark in that brain and go go read first? I mean, when <laughs> I think of hopping into a fantasy, and now I'm asking the therapist. I read it. It looks amazing. Joe, can we do this tonight? And then either it works or it tanks. Yeah, I've been thinking about that myself. You know, I want to give people like a guide to what consent really means and, you know, the difference between you're both on the same page, you have boundaries in place, you know how to do everything safely you have some estimation of how it feels. I keep thinking back to one of these couples, you know, and these are people that present as kind of hip, but vanilla, right? And it's only in their private life that they're doing our stuff. And nobody really knows, well, unless they talk to, you know, unless they talk to somebody who's in the scene, or in my case, they talk to me. And I'll never forget a friend of mine who, I'd known since I was a child and I met up with again when she was in her 40s and she was in a relationship with a guy and they decided to do S&M and the first thing he did was he burned her hand with a cigarette. Welcome to the story of O. And I'm like, did you discuss it? And she's like, no, it really hurts. And I said, did he do any aftercare or tell you to do? No. We didn't, you know, and I was like, right away, do some aftercare. Please put some needles pouring on that spot, you know, and take very good care of it. And that's a terrible thing. And you're going to have it forever. Which is not really what she had consented to. And which she didn't find erotic. So that's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. And yet, if I she forgave him because you know they were experimenting, I'm like, wow, you know that guy didn't know what he was doing, but he did it to you, and he didn't know how it would feel, and he didn't know what the repercussions with, and he, once he did it, probably felt too guilty to talk to you about it. Uh huh. And the good sense of hi, this is a burn. That, but see, that's real versus this is a wonderful and hot fantasy. And if, and all I can think of is in the movie, not the book, in the movie, the story of O, that's the way it ends. If you and this is what we through. fight against day by day. And they were very smart, educated people. But I've heard this so many times. I thought that's what S&M was. I thought if you're submissive, you're supposed to take anything. We've heard that from, you know, beginner subbies. Hey, even it's one thing, enjoying it's another. And I, I come back to how do you put the bookmark in the brain that says, this is really hot. Go check something first. How do you do that with sex in general? You know, I mean, it has to be taught from an early age. This is something that kids need to learn. You know, obviously I am for comprehensive sex education and I think it should go up to the age of 25. <laughs> Ending with things like parenting responsibilities. You know, like really address the spectrum of sexual health, at least until you're not only reproductive age, but of an age where you're probably either having kids or thinking of having kids. Health being the operative word there. Yes. Sexual health. Health, right. I would say sexual health, you know, just like we say sexual and reproductive rights, I would say sexual and reproductive education. Not just 
you know, about, you know, and, and relationship education and the meaning of consent in relationships. I feel that kids have a better understanding of consent than we did, for sure. Here, here. But it's something they have to either learn from their parents or from the internet. And that's not good. It goes against a lot of things that they learn from their extreme religious upbringing and their conservative educational. Being learning. ugly, better the internet than their parents. If only the internet was a consolidated monolithic thing where you could be assured that they're always going to good sources. I mean, I, I had a client who had SNM fantasies and ended up stalking incels because their dislike of women and what they did to women was a turn on. And it seemed safer than going to an SM site. Lord. <laughs> you know? And it filled her head with so much negativity about sex and relationships and what she should expect from men. And really she was just a, a sweet, somewhat kinky girl with low self-esteem who could have been sucked into a nightmare. True, true. But she did get a therapist at that point. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. But I-, I you know, But most people don't, they get carried away. I come back to, Far too many. Now, the disadvantage or advantage of being here in the Midwest is what I'm hearing constantly, which is, here's your sex education. Stay a virgin until you're married, and then your husband will tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the South. And which is why I say I would rather they have some information, because you read enough on the great God Google, you're going to get some input other than don't. I didn't say it was good, but is not some information good, bad, and indifferent better than none at all? If you have a curious mind and you're a learner, yeah. And you know how to learn, you know to go around and see conversations, but what if you end up someplace where Oh, no, man, you know, you, you can't give away that much power. Women were born to obey. Ugh. You know, it's our formational education. Yeah. That really does not make us better human beings. <laughs> You know, it teaches us racist things. It teaches us really anti-sex messages all the time. You know, it distorts history completely. Yeah. You know, American history was, you know, white Christian history. And I have nothing against white people. And I have nothing against Christians. But... It shouldn't be taught as fact. And it well, certainly shouldn't be taught as the only facts. Thank you. Thank you. I, I got to say, being here is an amazing education for me. It really is. Uh, not necessarily good, bad, or indifferent, just amazing. The things that are believed and taught, I find to some extent frightening. Mm -hmm. The whole, um, about 25 years ago, do you remember the chastity belt craze? Girls yep. in chastity and wearing these cute little white belts over their jeans to prove that they were going to be celibate until marriage. Mm -hmm. And coming back, I saw a couple of them on girls walking down the street. And I'm looking at this and going, really? A the internet has no not November. 
what the hell? <laughs> As a sexologist, I'm horrified. I mean, I'm laughing about it, but you know, taking a month off from jerking off does the body absolutely no good. Yeah, I'm going to say if you take the time to then do something constructive, you might be doing something here. Well, if you're so obsessed with jerking off that you can't get constructive things done, see a therapist. And break the habit that's preventing you from leading your life. But most of us, maybe not today at age 66, but certainly for most of my life, you know, coming once or twice a day was just fit in with everything else. Ideally, two or three times a day if I could. And I always had time to do my stuff. That was not what tore me away. But there are people who are so chronic. Usually they're Southern Baptists. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm trying to look at this like Lent. Uh, you know, hi, for one month, I will not buy a book. I will use the money to go do something else. For one month, I will not jerk off. I will use that 20 to 25 minutes of, you know, thought stimulation and the mechanics to do to, to listen to more radio, to read an extra newspaper, to... Uh, do some writing to put extra time into my go play ball with my kids uh -huh. uh, you know do something constructive play with my dog that <laughs> my best time that right there this is petunia she says hi and why hello and why hello cuteness <laughs> You know, it's funny, when we were thinking about sex education, I've got a, um, a book dealer that I love in London, who unfortunately knows my credit card, knows what, you know, <laughs> will do it. And a couple of weeks ago, he asked me whether or not I had ever seen the horn book. And I said, we have a copy in the library. And he said, another one just came across his, um, his counter and did I want it? Now, I don't know if you have ever seen this little monster. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's fabulous. Uh, this is what Naughty Girls read in the 20s. And it does tickle me. This is actually the second edition. Because the first edition, same year, didn't have illustrations. But it taught a woman how to have sex. Wow. It taught her how to give a blowjob. It taught her positions, which is why it's called uh, For the Knowledge of Good and Evil. Wow. That now, is it awesome. did tickle me because, I mean, it's horrendously dated, which is wonderful. <laughs> but uh, it was for the bad girl. She, she looks pretty good to me. Uh, yeah, I was thinking, and the photographer did a really nice job on her, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but it did tickle me that somebody had the good sense to create a book. Right. And the 20s were the last time sex was really wide open until probably the 70s, which opened it again. So there was a 50 year real clampdown on any kind of porn or sex or a complete, you know, homosexual hysteria, you know, psychiatry getting involved in putting people like us in loony bins and giving us Thorazine and medicating lays, uh, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, fetishists. And the missionary. Treating them to aversion therapy, which only traumatizes people. Yeah, doesn't stop the problem, just no. you know, makes, makes it more them, traumatic. 
or possibly more exciting. Think of the sons right. of Eden. You got punished if you were a bad boy, and if you happen to eroticize it, you've got that fetish for life. Yeah. And, you know, populist books like <clears throat> Fifty Shades in Grey come and go. They bring a wave, just like the story of O did. They bring a wave of experimentation and this belief that society will now change. And then you get somebody like Donald Trump in the White House and everything turns backwards. So you get, you know, you get a bunch of Republicans in Texas and they roll everything back for all the women in that state, you know? And that's unfortunately how history works. What's interesting now, of course, is the internet has sped up his human history on this crazy, breathtakingly strange, accelerated ride. And that was my, yeah, you know, that that was my next comment about this. We've got a whole generation who's being raised on more information in ten minutes than we got in half our lives. Correct. And are they finally, because they're getting to that, the point where they're quickly becoming the voting block, which I think is what is terrifying most mm -hmm. of the Republican Party. These mm -hmm. are coming up and even the young Republicans are, by their standards, liberal. Mm -hmm. So are we finally going to see a break in that historic swing of freedom, repression, freedom, repression? It's really hard to, for anybody to predict because the internet, the internet and its influence is unprecedented in human history. So, you know, will at some point, at some point, the internet become completely corporate. If it does, a lot of those free conversations go away. And a lot of that free information will go away. It'll, you know, I mean, every time they do, a, you know, the internet, what is it, the, the decency act or the, I mean, politicians have 8 million contingency plans to thwart sexual freedom. Will they age out of the system? Yes. But what is true in human history and has always been true, despite revolutions and everything else and social upheavals is that there's always gonna be that like 30 to 40% of people who don't go along with the consensus. Right now that's, we see its manifestation in the Trump voters, right? They're not giving up. The worst you know, part is they know it's a lie and they're buying it anyway. Yeah. You know, Russ, Russell Stombach? Yeah. Oh, yeah. From the NCF. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had posted like that funny scene out of an old uh, Monty Python, I guess it was Life of Brian, where the Black Knight is legless and he's still fighting. <laughs> Somebody had made that a, right a Halloween day course. So you just see like the top of his body, you know, and like his limbs all stretched out and people yeah. were making, yeah, you know, it's just the flesh wound is but a scratch, you know, all of that. But Russ said, that's like the uh, Trump people, you know, they're, they're missing their arms and their legs. They're completely unequipped. They're failing on every level and they're still trying to fight but we with every also, weapon they have who was it that said because it, it goes back oh. long before orwell uh tell the lie long enough and it becomes the truth 1984 right it's before orwell somebody said it before orwell did really I don't remember yeah how i know that i know that nixon echoed it even uh longfellow said, you know, when they talked about the ride of Paul Revere, well, why he didn't complete the ride? He said, Revere rhymed, the rest of William Doors didn't. And if I tell it long enough, that's what people will remember. He was right. I mean, it's taught in school. Paul Revere made the ride. No, Paul Revere started it and spent the night in jail. Right. 
the ride was completed by a guy named William Doors, two friends and a couple of girls. <laughs> but you don't learn that in history class. You learn no. a lie. Yep. Probably the Romans knew it. You know, they knew everything. <laughs> True that. <laughs> they did. And Trump is the classic example. I think he says something to that effect. It's been so long since I tried to crack the book, uh, The Art of the Deal. He said, just keep repeating the same line. Eventually, they'll believe it. Yeah. And that was also Nixon, the big lie. You just you know, keep telling the big lie and people will believe it. You the Trumpers know it's story. a lie and they believe it anyway. Mm -hmm. But then again, see, because I'm still trying to figure out the whole QAnon bullshit. So... You know, everybody's different. We know that already. And I think people who are raised, who are not very well educated or who are educated in a, on a very narrow path, like they have a religious upbringing and they go to a religious college and they never step outside of their bubble. Yeah. They are fully trained to believe that a belief system is as important, if not more important, than scientific facts. I, I get it. I do. I got just one button here that I've never understood, which is the basis of critical thinking and analysis. Well, uh, it's lacking. Something as simple as there's a pedophile ring in a, the basement of a pizza parlor in D.C., but the pizza parlor doesn't have a basement? So you go in guns blazing to free the kids from the basement of a building that doesn't have one? That didn't require much to find out before you risk time in jail over bullshit. Check. People are very emotional creatures. When they hear something, you know, there are key words, kids, kids in danger, people panic. Scary killer in the house. Do they need proof? Do they need to know that it was a prank? Do they, I mean, do they explore to see? No, they run in. That's what they're trained to do. Is that reflex or is that bread? I think it's fear. And the belief that they are in charge of the moral order of the universe. But that's not fear. That's, that's some sort of weird ass superiority complex. It is. It's something we sometimes call privilege, it, but it always does seem to come from organizations like the court system, the police, a whole lot of bad pastors, terrible priests yeah. and arrogant rabbis and arrogant imams all of whom have something personal to gain. Yeah. Usually power or money or both. And very often people externalize their own shame. So that's how you'll find people like a Newt Gingrich calling uh, Bill Clinton an adulterer while he's having an adulterous affair. Yeah, you're right. Right. You're right. Right? So it's like you blame other, well, of course, and again, Trump was a classic, you blame other people. You demonize other people for the things, you know, like you're doing. That you're doing. Yeah. There are a lot more narcissists in this country than we ever realized. Ooh. And after COVID, I would say the general climate of mental health is 
Really? Well, yeah. Uh, I was looking at an article, and I probably should have sent it to you, about a week ago, talking about an across-the-board decline in mental health in the past year and a half. Yeah. And that something about 25 or 30% of the population had already reached crisis over yeah. the lockdown. I know. And I can't help but wonder whether or not we've unleashed a brand new wave of PTSD of sorts. A lot of it has to do with, I think it hits Americans very hard because we're constantly being told how free we are and how important it is to go to sporting events and how important it is to have family gatherings and how important this is. And, you're not leading a real American life if you don't do this and do that. And a lot of it is, none of it is inward. All of it is outward. And I think there are other cultures where there's a very strong emphasis on think, read, analyze, True. expose yourself to museums, expose your, you know. Yeah. And it's not like go to this party or you're nobody. Um, I've often talked to uh, Jewel. What the hell is her real name? <laughs> Lori FOMO. We are big on the FOMO. Our young generation really feels that, you know, if they don't show up at an event, they've missed the most important thing something. in their lives. So that's, I think, a very uniquely American pressure. Jewel is that in man, like staying at home really unbearable for people. And she was saying with her and Warloki, who are just outside of London, England, um, aside from the fact that they received both a stipend, everybody in England received a small stipend and groceries from the government and ways to take care of themselves, they were also given books and encouraged to tune into music. And, uh, you know, once it was not quite locked down, but everybody stay away from everybody, go take a walk here or go take a walk there to keep, um, I guess it would be a kind of mental stimulation that would keep you thinking outward instead of crawling inward and feeling like uh, you've been traumatized, even though, you know, to some extent you had, but to encourage people to do other things and just sit and brood about the fact that they couldn't get out. American life is a very outward life, unless you live in a rural district, which I do. I mean, to us, not much has changed. Mm. Yeah, except that I don't get to see all my S&M friends, you know, and maybe we haven't gone out for meals as much, but, you know, or at all for a year, you know, but we could accommodate it. We haven't seen a decline in our mental health. Um, it was depressing at first, but you adjust. But a lot of people, their whole life is, they wake up in the morning, they have their morning routine, they go to work. They stop at a fast food place on the way for breakfast. They run to a place for lunch. They bring something home for dinner. They're on the phone constantly. They're going places constantly. They're picking up and delivering the kids to school constantly. And suddenly, they're stuck at home. The school thing tickled me because I've had neighbors that, you know, we yak over the back fence who have suddenly realized that little Johnny is not the angel that they thought he was because now they've been stuck at home with the little monster and they're trying to blame it on close confinement rather than the fact that the kid's a heathen and who really is everything their teacher said the little monster was <laughs> yep yeah i mean we're gonna i mean the repercussions of this are gonna last for years and years and leave a great weight i think on both the legal system and the health system because i think a lot of families had domestic violence that wasn't reported 
because people felt trapped by their conditions and there was nowhere to go and nobody to even contact at some of the public agencies anymore. Well, it created it. We have a situation here, yeah. a couple of situations in our area in Evansville versus Newburgh, where suddenly being together 24 hours a day, seven days a week, created violent situations that probably would never have happened right. in other situations. And a couple of marriages of good acquaintances, I wouldn't say friends, I know have ended over it. Oh, wow. Well. And uh, yeah. At least one is in therapy because they're going to try and, you know, have a separation, reestablish their friendship and get back together again. Because the question they're trying to figure out is, were the violent tendencies always there? Or did the, the COVID confinement create something that would not have happened? had they not been forced together. And I find that fascinating as I'm watching the statistics right in this little area go up in terms of uh, violent acts, women's shelters, because there's one around the block from the library that was usually, you know, you might've had one woman waiting, maybe. Now they're sending women out of state because they have nowhere to put them. Well, wow. yeah. So it would, would not surprise me. I mean, I feel that a lot of violence and cruelty happen because the person or the people involved are really stressed out. So a really stressed out person might trigger somebody and a really stressed out person might lash out at somebody. Stress is really the enemy in human life. And some of us can handle a lot of stress and some of us crack. Well, we don't talk about stress. We don't, it, it's not something that's in the American vocabulary. You know, I eat stress for lunch. Uh, I don't know if, if as a culture, and I realize this is awfully broad, we even understand what stress is yeah both physically how it looked how it manifests as well as emotionally i i don't think we even get it no we don't but you know the harvard medical school sends out newsletters that talk about it almost every almost every newsletter is about <laughs> learn how to get some exercise learn how to de-stress because I think the medical world is realizing that stress is a factor in an awful lot of illnesses, not just in how you recover from the illness, but the development of an illness. Wow. So de-stressing and, and stress is especially bad on elders. And apparently they know my age because that's, I feel like I'm getting... <laughs> A targeted email for what people my age need to be doing, you know, to not have stress. And that includes a lot of exercise, which people my age don't usually do. And, you know, a lot of calming activities and meditation and learning to feel good about yourself. And, you know, I go to uh, a, a friend of mine runs a, a special podcast for seasoned women and um like the term okay <laughs> it's an outreach primarily to women of color and but anybody over 55 is welcome to come in and they have experts talking last time it was really cool it was two doctors from india and pakistan respectively talking about the reproductive and sexual health challenges that they deal with all the time okay. you know and they talked about the impact of stress anyway this this podcast really one thing i've learned is that a lot of the women who come to it you know they're not doing self-care they didn't know they had to do self-care they don't understand the value of it i mean they do by coming to this class 
But that's because these are really interesting, intelligent women who really enjoy having serious discussions and listening to experts and academics talk to them about how to age gracefully as a oh, sexual well, being. Is that podcast open to anybody or is it restricted? Yeah, I can set you up with the lady I'm friends with. Sure. And now, tell her you, you would be really interested in it. I would love to. But now, taking what you just said, how often are we told that self-care is just laziness? Which all comes back to that stress thing. Um, it, we're a culture that thinks it's a shame that, you know, to, that, that somehow you're being self, you know, that if you love yourself, that self-love is selfish. selfish. Right. That self-care is self-indulgence. Yeah. You know? And really in the way, you know, a lot of the ways that people think of self-care in America is you go to somebody and they take care of you. <laughs> true. Very true. Right? Self-care is you true. go to a therapist, you... You get your chakras checked out, you see your chiropractor, you get a massage, you go to a spa. This is how most people de-stress. Nobody teaches them how to be alone. I've been working with a, a client at 75. All I want him to do is make 10 minutes of happy time a day. It's a kinky person, right? 10 minutes that's just happy time and he finally confessed he doesn't know how to be happy unless he's watching something or listening to something you know what i mean unless he's on the computer just or, or do, doing something in other words just sitting alone and being with his own thoughts even for 10 minutes he has no way of figuring out how to be happy in those 10 minutes You may have just given me a brand new mantra. What's that? 10 minutes. That's Ten a minutes. fascinating idea. Yes, because this is a guy who can't, who can't stand to be alone on some level. I mean, he loves being alone, but he spends all of his time entertaining himself. <laughs> okay got it you know what i mean i mean he's either working which he really likes his, the the work that he does so that's sort of a stimulus and he likes watching things and he likes talking to girls on a channel and he likes doing physical you know hitting the gym but there's <laughs> Tell him to spend 10 minutes alone without devices, and he's at a loss. Me, if you told me 10 minutes to relax, I'd la lie down, get into a good yoga position, and resent having to leave it. <laughs> Go outside, feed my birds. I do it, you know. And I give myself a half hour a day of happy time every day. Most days, I should say. But I would say... Five out of seven days, I'm getting a half hour of either just playing with my dogs or, you know, doing stretches or just emptying my brain, going zen. Something that, ooh, oh, gosh. Mommy's on a very important podcast with very important oh, people. Oh, Gloria, that 10 minutes a day has just given me an idea. What's that? Should we have a class together? <laughs> um, <laughs> 10 minutes. I've thought about it, like, just to get people doing it, you know, of like, we just get together and breathe together for 10 minutes. For 10 minutes, just yeah. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, but you have to empty your head. And from there, you know, you have to build it so that when you go somewhere and you're freaked out, you can take... You can go to the bathroom and take those 10 minutes right there with yourself 
and put yourself in the right headspace of tranquility. Oh, that place. Yeah. Uh, see, I keep putting That's the secret. That's my secret to life. See, for me, it's 10 minutes outside just listening to the birds. That's that's similar. You know, I as long as you're not still processing, analyzing, criticizing, and reviewing in your head. If I can, I just watch them because they fascinate me. You know, it comes back to behold the lilies of the field. They plant. I hope you stay with me when you go to self so you can glory in this incredible setting that I'm in. Uh, or at least come down and see it. I mean, heck, uh, you know, you know, I hadn't, couldn't even find flowers <laughs> that could find you. But um, I'll give you the you super, know? super secret code to find me. I kind of like it when people can't find me. You know, I had a feeling. <laughs> but just going outside, I will simply watch the birds. Yeah, they fascinate me in both their beauty and their song and I can forget how long I'm out there sometimes you know 45 minutes goes by or I don't notice until the phone rings and I go oh my god I've been out here for an hour uh, when I have a really insanely busy day I calendar my break so it gives me a reminder and then I tell Alexa to break me out of my trance after 15 minutes. <laughs> because Jen as Jennifer put it, I'm not just a type A personality, I'm an A plus. <laughs> <laughs> she don't <laughs> so, you know, I have a mistress has a very strict schedule. I have methods for everything I do. So everything goes on the calendar. And if I'm looking at a really shit week, I make sure that I have at least 15 to 30 minutes where I can go and not think about a damn thing. I like Except it. what a cute curly tail my dog has. You know? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> you know, the simplest little things. Or I'll listen to a little bit of my favorite retreat is the uh, the soundtrack from Fantasia. Aww. Yeah. But from the time I think I saw Fantasia when I was six. Music is really great. And the delight was it was nothing I could sing to. <laughs> so I had to sit and just listen yep and listen to the dance of the flowers and listen to Tchaikovsky and relax into the music and all of a sudden I realized as I was listening to Night at Bald Mountain I was seeing it all over again in my mind and just sitting there watching hippopotami dancing which can still make me grin. 420 time came early to you that day, huh? <laughs> you know, 60 yeah. some odd years later, yeah, it will still relax me. But that's us. How the hell do you teach someone to relax if they don't know they're even stressed out? You they know, need like, to talk to somebody who can show them how they're being stressed out. Usually that's going to be, sometimes it's, you know, at their routine medical, they could say, what do you think? Do you think, you know, because stress symptoms do show up at a physical. Yes, but America does not know, in my humble opinion only, mm -hmm. what stress looks like. Much well, less. Every, every doctor, who, you know, the funniest one was my doctor said, Well, Gloria, so uh, you seem to have a lot of anxiety. When did it start? And I'm like, The day I was born. <laughs> when I started, it came with me. It was a gift. You know, it was a gift in my genes. From the universe, right? Uh, yeah, from the universe to always have anxiety. But I will say that once I got to around the age of 60, I started taking it seriously. 
because I knew that it was going to impact my health, even though it hadn't when I was younger. It's different now. My heart is different now. Mm -hmm. My lungs are different now. Everything is different. So I, you know, I just, I follow science. When study after study kept popping up about the ramifications of stress, I took them seriously. When newsletter after newsletter hit my box saying, don't you want to knock off some stress? So I, uh, I was very interested in yoga in my 20s. And, mm. and that's always been my go-to to de-stress since then. I don't mean like, you know, all the positions and stuff. I mean, the basic stretching and breathing and emptying Absolutely. my mind. Yeah. Especially Quite. emptying my mind. Now I can just like, you know, it's like file manager. I can just hit the button and all the files fly. Out. <laughs> then I reboot and, you know, new files come back. The one advantage I had had in that I've been meditating for over 40 years and then with Jill's heart attack trying to explain to her that, yes, a lot of this was diet, bad diet. And we've been fighting over that since we got married. You know, she's never met a vegetable that she really had a good relationship with. <laughs> Food is off the table. But um, a lot of it was how she manifested stress. Yes, she goes to the gym and she works out, but nothing empties here. It's a mechanical movement that yeah, and that's right. Like I, when I used to garden, I used to like, man, I would, I was ruthless with my weeds, man. I would just like, I would kill them with abandon, you know, and I would think of somebody I hated when I would. Do well, I, I'm not going to say that I don't. I have said there are an awful lot of people still alive because I garden. <laughs> But now I go empty. Now when I go in the garden, it's, I'm doing this, you know, it's Zen. All, I'm doing this task and this task is all I'm doing. I'm thinking about my task and my task is on, the only thing I'm thinking about. And that's very nice. Because mm -hmm. I look at the collective garden and I will walk. Part of it is, is the curiosity of, I wonder what happens if I put that here. And just, you know, see what happens. But I don't want anyone to misconstrue that de-stressing is for old people. De-stressing is something you should learn in your 20s to stay your healthiest, mentally and physically. Without thinking it's self-indulgent. Self-indulgent or selfish. Right. Yeah. You know, we even like people cringe with me time. And everybody goes, you need some me time. But then on the other hand, we kind of treat me time as like a little shameful. Like it's something that you, you deserve after you've struggled and suffered to, you know, it's like, all right, you've been up since 6 a.m. with your crazy kids. You spent the whole day, you know, earning your paycheck, running the household from a distance, taking care of everybody, making everybody's schedules, trying to squeeze some time for food in. And then you'll say, I'm getting me time, you know, that special 15 minutes that, that, that I finally deserve. Hell no, you deserved it all day. And maybe, just maybe, if or maybe between time first, a lot of this would have been much easier. Right. Which is hard to expect of a working mom to be able to squeeze it in in the morning. But, you know, the idea is that everybody has a 10 minute break during the day. Everybody can find a 10 minute break. Maybe not every single day, but most people, even the most industrious of us, can. And we owe it to ourselves. Or as I like to remind people, you know, if you if you grind yourself down, who's going to be there to run the show? That is a wonderful concept. 
turning that concept into reality. That's the hard part. It is. We have a very puritanical culture where people are encouraged to fuck off eight hours watching TV and buying a lot of food and eating continuously. Right? But God yeah. forbid you took that time to just baby yourself. Yeah. Be still. To be still, to give yourself a massage, to, you know, on bad days, I take my shiatsu machine with me to bed. <laughs> I plug it in and I lie on top of that and I burn incense and I, you know, I give myself a half an hour, you know, to get uh, machine robbed and to inhale something wonderful and to listen to good music, you know, and just try to forget about the person who just killed himself or, you know, forget about, you know, put it aside because it'll be there when I get back. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a hard one. Because we- I think we, every BDSMer just work can through, master this. You know, just work through it. You'll be fine, just work through it. Don't Bullshit. stop for a minute, just work through it. Right, and, well, yeah, right. And to that, I say it's the same as with like a BDSM trauma. You know, just because you can work through it and say to yourself, that's okay, I'm going to survive. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have an effect on you or that your brain doesn't remember it. Yes. And in the back of your brain, something went wrong and something is stressing you out and it's going to give you a tummy ache, if not a headache, if not cause an arthritis flare up, if not cause other problems, other conditions to flare up. You know, all the immunological disorders are aggravated by stress. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Stress is really, stress creates stress chemicals. Stress chemicals suppress the circulation of joy chemicals like endorphins and oxytocin and adrenaline. And that's why depressed people are, you know, flat. Because they have so many stress chemicals flooding their system. That's why, actually, I'm really into the physiology of, you know, sex. In my, in my side gig as a sex therapist, in my main gig as a sex therapist. I was about to say, isn't that the main part? That is the main part these days. And um, that's why a lot of people can't come with stress. They defeat their own orgasm by being unable to empty their minds. True that. True. You know, in yeah. order to have an orgasm, you need the same skill you have in order to have a good BDSM experience which is to disinhibit yourself, to go with it, to allow yourself to be vulnerable, whether you're top or bottom, in the moment. Even if the moment is just with yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy either. No, it's not, but it's the way to ecstasy. I mean, people don't achieve ecstasy when they're all tensed up and they have a wall inside them. More years and that's ago. true in BDSM and that's true even in vanilla sex, even if those things manifest differently. Right? Glory, you are on to quite possibly a whole different profession, or as you put it, a very interesting side gig. <laughs> Stress, isn't it? You know, if, as I've listened to a lot of podcasts in the last year and a half about self-care, about exploration, about 
uh, this new you that you could be. It seems to me, and we come back to in my humble opinion only, we're looking at the goal and not looking at the first steps. We, it, it keeps coming back to, at least for me, understanding what stress is to be able to look at how to de-stress to create all of the things that theoretically we want. But the concept of stress always seems to me to be the concept we don't tackle. You were just mm -hmm. talking about stress chemicals and mm -hmm. how it affects the body. Now, the average methodology for this, hey boy, at least in my perspective would be, uh, I can't sleep, I'm going to the doctor because I can't sleep. So I'm going to go get something to help me sleep. The doctor then prescribes a pill, which may or may not work because the issue that made you not sleep is still a problem. The issue has not been tackled, therefore. So we keep looking at, thanks baby. We keep looking at the, the end, which is I just need some sleep. And any way to get there instead of coming back to square one and figuring out what started it. Mm -hmm. And that whole S word, that whole stress word. Or actually doing something within your own agency to relieve it so that you don't feel like you're dependent on drugs, which is another big thing. I mean, doctors are just over prescribing like crazy. And you know, I really do believe that, you know, <laughs> emptying your head of thoughts before bed is key to actually getting a good night's sleep. What is stress? That's the side gig. Stress is a natural body process, usually in response to fear, and it releases fear chemicals through your system. That's the class you need to be, that's the side gate, Gloria. What is stress? Hi, today we're going to talk about, this is what stress is. In our next class, we're going to talk about recognizing what stress is here. Let's talk about stress before we get up, before we start out for work. Are you panicked? Americans don't recognize it. Americans want a pill. I want to disagree with you. I don't know if I can. Um, Americans want to relieve the problem and don't recognize what's caused it. I would say for a wide range of reasons, including stress. You know, it's sort of like the people who really have bad mental health are often the last ones to seek help. Agreed, agreed. And some of that is because that's their normal and they don't wanna change their normal. They don't wanna be medicated into not having colorful experiences the kind of colorful experiences you can have, let's say being bipolar. You know, those highs are really high. True. And they feel really good. Now, is it don't want to change or don't know that they can change or don't know that there is something else out there to change too? I don't think they're given enough hope that they as individuals can control their bodies. And that's a whole other subject. You know, I mean, and that's a split of everything that happens to me is God's will or everything that happens to me, it's helpless and only a doctor can fix it. Again, it's this great state of handing over agency to outside forces. Ouch. 
Ouch. I'm desperately- But I think that's human nature. You know, we're, we're very social animals and we're raised with an intrinsic and I think unmovable understanding of authority, you know? I mean, some of these things are like, girl, the bonobos do that too. You know? <laughs> We're never gonna eradicate it, but we can be educated to be healthier human beings, to learn how really to take care of the human organism, which is not taught. You know, there's so many things that are, you know, for example, all of these rules that we have that gender care, like men can do this and women can't do that. And this is a man's disease and this is a woman's disease. Even there, it, it's so much grayer than that. Yes. You know, it, it's like, it reminds me of the days when we used to think all fetishists were men, that only men oh, had okay. men. Right? That's what it reminds me of, you know? It's a wrongful gendering. Yes, there are definitely differences between our bodies. And there are very much differences in general, how genders uh, can deal with pain. But there's very little science to support the way Western medicine confuses gender really badly and doesn't understand it and doesn't understand that we're all just basically human beings. It doesn't matter what gender, what color, what orientation, it doesn't matter. We are all the same basic human body. But what is true is of every single human body is slightly different from every single other human body. So you can have men who look like men physically, but are really more than women, more like women who may or may never transition. And there are women who definitely look and act more like men and have a closer biology probably to men than other women, but they're never gonna transition. And then there's some who will transition. And there's a lot of shades of gray in between that. We in between we and all of that. And when we start looking into our DNA, that's when we start, you know, but we don't even have the tools yet to look at a lot of the questions that plague us all. Like what makes somebody this way, you know? And what makes somebody, you know, people always ask me, where do fetishes come from? Well, they come from a lot of places. What they don't come from is the Freudian notion that uh, people with fetishes were sexually traumatized. Here, here. You know, I mean, you know, there's this whole way, and this brings us full circle back to this legal case is, you know, this notion that if you don't only want to fuck, something's wrong with you. Because that's what red-blooded Americans do. They fuck. They fuck a lot. Um, <laughs> I think so. I mean, yeah, okay. You know, so anything that isn't fucking, masturbation, same-sex relationships, polyamorous uh, yeah, and monogamous, right? That's what a heteronormative sexuality, yeah. right? Binary. Unfortunately, yeah. true. You know, and it's so wrong. It's so unnatural for humanity. Yes. It's unnatural for the human animal. Yeah. It is. So has civilization gone too far? What do you think, Viola? <laughs> yeah, see, it, it maybe if we backed up a little bit, we might see a little bit more of this correct. Let's back up to a good matriarchal structure. We had a lot less problems. <laughs> There's oh, a lot more kindness. Problems. A lot more kindness. 
I still think you need to be teaching a class, a podcast on <laughs> stress, specifically to women. Like I said, Glory, before we can get to self care, we need to understand why. And it's the why we don't get. Trying to explain to someone that uh, your worries are going to manifest into things that are far worse than ulcers, because ulcer seems to be the only thing people understand when it comes to stress. Ulcer, heart attack, well, ulcer and heart attack, not even stroke. Uh, if you worry too much, you're going to have an ulcer. If you worry too much, you're going to have a heart attack. How about if you worry too much, you're going to have a flare-up. If you worry too much, you're going to... Uh, good your herpes heart. will come back. I, you're going to have a psoriasis attack. You're going to have a yes. thousand other things. Yes, you are. Because we don't understand... That stress is more than just a state of mind. It's a chemical, it's a series of chemical reactions in the body. It is. It's not just here. No, it isn't. It's not just your immunological system either. No, that's one step past where most Americans go because my, immuno my uh, immunology is a state of body. My stress is only a state of mind. So put something else in my mind and my stress will go away. That is the lie that's automatically built in. So in yoga and in my philosophy, stress is not only in the mind because we store stress in the body. So in order sometimes to relieve the mind, we have to learn to relax certain muscles. You've and this is where the, that's where the mind and the body depend on each other. You see, your brain depends on your body. Your, let's say you get stressed out in your head and you send out those stress signals. Suddenly your foot twists up or you get a pinched nerve or your neck starts throbbing, right? Or you get a stomach ache. Well, when you go to take care of that, it isn't just good enough to think your way out of it. You actually have to try to relax that part of your body. So that part of your body, or give it what it wants. So that part of your body can send okay signals back to your brain and say, stop worrying about me, I've got it covered. And that's, that's a deeper practice, but- That's a series of classes, Glory. <laughs> all right I, now i'm being very serious if you do, i am one i am one five foot one uh-huh well, that is 14 foot of energy that is capable of multitasking in ways most people can't yeah i'm 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 kind of multitask to the max but i would do it with you Uh -huh -huh. Or someone you were pointed. <laughs> I keep coming back to before you can reach that goal, you've got to really understand the starting line. You do. And I think this, this would be, you know, it's not an easy education to give because basically it's like with sex education, which I do in my practice a lot. You wouldn't think as a therapist, that's part of it. But actually for some patients, that's 50% of it. As I was telling you, you know, these people who are doing BDSM and have zero education in BDSM ethics, let's call it, or, you know, BDSM cultural ethics, you know, I mean, they need an ethics class. And then I had a patient who, her boyfriend, you know, she wanted to try BDSM and agreed to a spanking and he had no idea how to give one. So he just started in with the, boy, did she regret that. Yeah. You know, he just whapped on her, you know, there was, and I'm like, you need a buildup. 
you need to know what you're doing. You need to make sure that the person you're spanking is, is it, at least at the beginning, enjoying it and loving it and wiggling in your lap. And then you can, once you know you have them aroused, you can probably take them to new levels. But you can't just you know wail on somebody and expect them to like it. You know, so I mean, it gets back to some very basic things and people need re-education because we as a culture do not educate at all about who we really are inside. Well said. Not at all. It's well as if said. it's as if we never made any of the discoveries we've made. Or like a thousand pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. We don't know how to put that puzzle together. Yeah. And I, it's not like I came to all this. I mean, the only reason I know all this stuff is because I, I will read anything and everything that has to do with brain science and sex science and anything that could impinge on sex and your sex life. You know, if, if it's going to change your function, or impact your function, I want to know about it. So I can fix you. I have a crazy idea for our yeah. next get together. Okay, because yeah, we gotta we're running late again, of I, course. I, well, it's the two of us. <laughs> in when we get together in two weeks, uh, uh we're I'm I'm going to start the recording off with. This is Vi talking to Dr. Bram about stress. Okay. 10 minutes, that's all. And okay. I'll stop the recording. We are going to break for about five minutes so that Zoom will record it separately. Come back together and then enjoy our conversation. I think I'm going to start every meeting that way. You're going to have a 10-minute slot. Okay. We are going to have a 10-minute slot that talks about stress. Okay. Listen, if you are in a marginalized community, you need to work on stress. And 10 minutes, that's all, just 10. Everybody who's in a marginalized community, which is half the people in the city. In the world. Yes. But, but you know, I love our world. 10 minutes. That, and you had said, just take 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. I, will I will try to be my most relaxed self. 10 minutes. Just. I'll do self-care uh, before I meet up with yes. you. <laughs> I'll take that. And <laughs> if we can get, I don't know, maybe 10 segments of just those little bits of 10 minutes. Let's talk about stress. And then maybe one day it's just, let's listen to, just be still. Let's listen to some music together. Mm -hmm. Be stress. Or let's- I'm, I'm working on an audio, you know, I'm working on an audio series that's really yes! kind of in response to all the mental health crises out there, which is just teaching people like, how to forgive yourself after a mistake, how to, you know, all the things that keep people up at night. I'd like them to start getting better sleep. That's the first thing you can do to re reduce stress. If you want to talk about practical things, believe it or not, staying hydrated, I know the cliche, and getting enough rest, another cliche. They're actually critical too. We're going to talk, we're going to put all that together into mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Okay. And we're, we're going to just keep, and we're going to talk you. about stuff that is good for every single human being, what I ever shape, size, age, blah, blah, brain. blah. For just that 10 minutes. Okay. I'm going to pick your brain. All right. Because rolling up in there are some of the most amazing thoughts that I've had the privilege to listen to in a long time. Thank you so much. The problem is a whole lot more people need it than just me. Well, that's another thing I do. And for all those women that you've said, you know, ask how do you be Gloria Bram, I also carve out time every day to just think. 
<laughs> Just to think. Another art that has been lost in That's a whole different post-industrial culture. <laughs> That's a whole different conversation. I got a lot of big words, huh? Yeah. For a girl from Brooklyn. Dr. Brand, where is my date book? Here it is. Oh my God. I thought you'd be calling me Glory by now. Well, since we're about to spend 10 minutes talking about stress, uh -huh. Dr. Brand. All right. Fair in two weeks, we are going to be talking about stress. Just, just okay. 10 minutes and then- I won't stress about fun. it. And then we can have some fun, but oh my God. By the time we get finished, Kat is working on two of, of our Zooms now. I know she's crazy, but I want to just hand them to you and go, hi, here's some interesting stuff for your blog. Cool. I'm feeling those little separate 10 minutes are going to help an awful lot of, and I'm selfish, women. I hope so. Don't be, that's not selfish. Women need the help. And Men I, need help too, but. We need it more know. than they do. And I, I know that's a pain. I have a vagina and I'm fond of women. <laughs> no, I mean, I'd, I'd be a woman no matter what body I had, I think. By choice. I, I kind of like it. You know, and I think it's got a little more power than the external plumbing. Besides that, I think about how easily it gets injured and, you know, I go, ow, oh, thank God it's internal. You can't get to it quite as easily. You know, mind and body connection. It's only culture that has taught us to view everything from the neck down differently from our minds. Or to, and we learn to disconnect our minds from our genitals. So there's some unlearning to be done there. It's all good. Lori, I got you down for the 16th. We're going to have an interesting first 10 minutes. I am looking forward to it. I have so My beautiful fun. friend. Okay. Well, See there we go. In two. I know. Two weeks. I'm going to mark it down now. The name of the chat is the Nana Chat, and I will send you uh, a link to the very lovely woman who runs it. Okay. Thanks. I'm looking forward to that one too. Okay. Love you. Love to everybody listening. Bye.